Ladies and gentlemen, Ruben Meerman. Ruben, welcome to the show. Welcome to Become Your Own Superhero. Thanks for having me. The surfing scientist, affectionately yeah. known. How did that come about? Uh, I adopted that nickname in 1996 when I was setting up a school incursion program on the Gold Coast, um, visiting schools, doing science presentations for kids, blowing stuff up with liquid nitrogen, etc. cetera. And um, I, sur I surfed then a lot more than I surf now, I must say, but um, being someone who surfs and being a scientist, it just sort of <laughs> had a nice ring to it. And um, and at the time, we were trying to lift the profile of science as a career because in 96, there was still a bit of a uh, sort of stereotype that scientists are nerds and la, la, la. Now we all wear that with badge with pride. But back then, it was not so great that, you know, scientists had a bad rep as not being so cool, which that's totally changed now. So anyway, I surf and I'm a scientist. That's it. Well, you're also described as a physicist a scientist and a speaker or a presenter. I think if we had to describe what you did for a crust. Yeah. And one of your TEDx talks, which we'll talk about in a second, if you like, has had over 10 million views. Yeah. I don't know if you've kept a, a, a recent tally. I don't know if you jump on there and have a look just to see how the views are ticking away. I That's sure do. It's hilarious. Uh, I, I look at the comments to see what people say. It's fantastic. <laughs> and what are, what are people saying? What are people saying about this, this TEDx talk? Uh, they either love it or they hate it. Uh, and the ones who hate it, hate it because it concludes by saying that if you want to lose weight, you need to eat less and move more. And that makes some people's brains explode. And then there's other people who really connect with what it's saying and have never thought about it, weight loss from that point of view before. And, and they are glowing and there's not, not much happens in between those two extremes. So they either love me or hate me. Well, I was once told by John Yeo, who's the TEDx curator for Melbourne. I don't know if you know that name, but he, he said, Laban, to, to do a TEDx talk, you need to have a polarizing idea. Ah. But I don't know whether they gave you that heads up before you did yours, but clearly you've triggered that, that polarizing point, And that's maybe why it's been so successful. But I'm trying to think of any other TEDx talks that have had that many views. And I'm thinking that might rival even Brene Brown and some of her work. Oh, uh, um, I know that the, I, I haven't checked hers, but, uh, and I don't really sort of try to figure out who's had more or less than me, but I, I imagine there's a lot more, of, like it's been up for seven years and I imagine there's quite a few videos with a, a heck of a lot more views, but then 10 million is pretty impressive. It gets about a million views a year. And it's an evergreen topic, right? Like we all, everyone wants to know about weight loss. And uh, the title of the video is The Mathematics of Weight Loss. Really, the title should have been When You Lose Weight, Where Does the Fat Go? Because uh, that's really what it's about. And I, I just happened to do some maths on it. But um, yeah, 10 million. I mean, it's, it's, it just keeps ticking over because people are interested in weight loss always. Well, we are entering a, a time in history where we are the fattest that we've ever been. We are the sickest that we've ever been. And we are on the precipice of a, a metabolic health um, pandemic or yeah. issue that's going to bankrupt all of the first world countries if we don't do something about it. So maybe let's explore how the weight loss works from a scientific point of view, in your opinion. Um, so all I did, I better explain that I, I'm definitely not a weight loss expert, uh, or I'm, I'm not a medical person. So I, um, don't kind of have any secret or extra knowledge beyond what the general advice is that you get from dietitians and doctors, etc. Um, in terms of weight loss, so uh, like, I'll just separate two things out. So we don't make people's brains explode as they're listening to this, uh, podcast, um, I will. I don't really touch on what's a healthy diet versus an unhealthy diet. That's way outside of my expertise, um, and I know it's also really controversial. Um, the thing that I am trying to help people understand is that the mechanism for losing weight is actually really, really simple. So healthy is complicated. 
what makes something healthy or unhealthy is really complicated, particularly when you've extended all the way to, you know, uh, lifestyle, diet and lifestyle, complicated. But your weight is extremely simple. Um, and it, we've known what happens to the fat you lose uh, when you're losing weight since about 1774. Um, so I'll give you a little timeline of this. When Captain Cook sailed into Botany Bay, scientists had not worked out what happens to the food you eat after you eat it. They didn't know what a fire is. Uh, so they didn't know if you burn a log of wood in a fire, what happens to the mass that goes missing. Um, they didn't know what happens to candles when you burn them or anything flammable. They had theories that turned out to be wrong. So that's when Captain Cook sailed into Botany Bay, 1770. No one knew. By the time the first fleet sailed into uh, Sydney Cove, that's 1788, it had all been sort of pretty much worked out. We, we then knew that when something's burning, whether it's food inside your body or a piece of wood or a piece of paper, when it's burning, uh, it's, it's a chemical reaction between whatever it is that you're burning. So it could be carbohydrates, could be fat, could be protein, could be a lump of wood, which is all those things. Um, when that's burning, it's reacting with the oxygen in the air and it's forming new substances. Uh, so you're not losing any of the matter. The matter is being converted by changing chemically from being food or wood or whatever and, car uh, and oxygen into carbon dioxide and water. And that's all you get when you burn carbohydrates and fat. So they're the only two waste products, the matter that you get out. Um, when you're burning protein, you also make carbon dioxide and uh, water and two more substances, which are, uh, well, in the human body, you make urea, uh, which you expel in your urine. Um, and you also make a little bit of sulfate, which also comes out in your urine so when you burn anything you're not destroying any matter you're just converting that matter from what it was carbohydrates fat protein combining it with oxygen and then converting it to new stuff now i didn't discover any of that that's been known since the 1700s the reason i gave that tedx talk about this what what happens to fat when you lose it is um to share that fact because i discovered that most people don't learn that. I certainly didn't learn it at school, um, but I got interested myself because I'd lost a bit of weight in so 2013. I lost about 16 kilos and which, I mean, I didn't even think I had that much to lose, but when you, once you get started with losing weight and you see how easy it is, you can just keep going until you, wherever you want to stop. So I, I pushed stop at 70 kilos. Um, but during that weight loss, is when I got interested in this question myself because I didn't know what happens to fat when you lose it either. I, I've got a physics degree, never did chemistry, never did biochemistry. So when I first started reading what's really going on, it was as amazing to me as it is to everyone who first learns this stuff. It's like, oh, wow, when I'm like, I'm converting the weight that I'm losing into carbon dioxide and I'm exhaling it, which, I mean, blows my mind. Um, so I did some maths on that and figured out because fat can only turn into carbon dioxide and water, there's the only two waste products. My physics brain immediately went to the question, ah, oh, so if I lose 10 kilograms of fat, how many of those kilograms did I exhale and how many turned into water that then it, that mixes with your body water and it comes out of you the same way the water you drink comes out of you. So metabolic water are you talking about? That's right, yeah. And that's created inside your mitochondria when you're burning food. Um, so they're inside all of your cells, except for red blood cells and one or two other kinds. But so all of your cells are making inside their mitochondria carbon dioxide and water. And that all comes out of the cell into your bloodstream. You breathe out the CO2 pretty quick. The water just becomes part of, it's called metabolic water, but it's indistinguishable H2O from the water that you drank but you made it yourself out of food and oxygen. It's, it's amazing to know this stuff. It doesn't necessarily help anyone, but so yeah. <laughs> well, I, uh... just, just, to, just to interject there for a second, Ruben. Mm. Last weekend, I ran my third 100 kilometer ultra marathon. Amazing. 
And yeah, and I, and I, this time I did it a little bit differently. I tried to do it fat adapted. So for the first 91 kilometers, I got by on less than 200 grams of carbohydrate from cheese, coconut water, and some milk, some cow's milk. Uh huh. And I, I did the first half in about seven hours, it ended up taking me 20 hours and 15 minutes. And my reason, my re, which is the slowest time it's taken me, by the way, oh. the reason for that is I recently started doing some manual labor. I've been laying epoxy resin flooring. Okay. And I spent my taper week on my knees, which I wouldn't recommend for anyone planning on running that far. Oh. So I was in, I was in quite a lot of discomfort early on uh -huh. from, from that. But, right. you know, had, had I not had that, I reckon I would have been able to knock many more hours. And because of the time it took me, I ended up running out of food and then at 91 Ks took on some bananas and some a cliff bar and some lollies, right? Okay. But, but what, what I found was between like kilometer 70 to 90, I was stopping to wee every 20 minutes and going for a good wee, way more than the liquid I was taking in, which was just water and salt tablets. And my body fat percentage went down nearly two and a half percent during the course of that run. Two and a half percent. So how many kilos of body fat is we talking there? To, well, so how, I, how much was, do you weigh? I was 86 kilos at the start of the race and I finished at like, I don't know, 82 or something by the time I finished. And sorry to be picky because I'm a nerd. So when right. you give me numbers, I'm going to like, bing, bing, my nerd brain starts wanting more information. So two, you lost two and a half percent of body fat. How did you get that number? Like, did oh, you I've got some DEXA scan or? Biometric scales that I've been using. Oh, okay. All right. So I don't know the accuracy of those. Um, are, they, are, are they good? Do you know? Uh, well, the only accuracy that I can rely upon is I've been using them for two and a half years. So the, the uh -huh. data that's going in there, even if it's wrong is consistent, you know what I mean? Oh, okay, yes, that's very good, so, yes. So yeah, that's it's, right. it's not a definitive science, so feel free to pick it apart, but I I visibly was a lot leaner. Right. Vis like yeah. a lot more vascular and stuff as well, which is interesting. Um, well, yeah, um, I, I can't do the numbers on the fly, I'd have to grab a calculator. I mean, you know, a, a 100 grams of fat contains about 3,900 kilojoules and in a 100k run which took you how long 20 hours and 15 minutes yeah wow that's amazing <laughs> i can't believe anyone can run for that long in one go but but i did um way back and i've forgotten most of the numbers but I, i've written a book about how weight loss works a while back now it came out in 2013 and uh in that book which is called big fat myths i um looked at what 24 hour ultra marathon runners how much energy do they need to do that kind of a run and um i seem to remember that it was up around the seventy thousand kilojoules how many calories would that be uh divide by 4.2 ish so you know about ten thousand, something like that uh a little bit less it's yeah. a lot it, um uh and look I, I tend not to talk about energy too much because I prefer to stick with how much mass that represents in terms of exhaled carbon dioxide, because that's much more tangible. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, it makes sense that you would have burned through a fair bit of your reserves um, and you did it fat. Um, what did you call it? You said fat, you fat adapted. Fat so adapted. I'm, my, my traditional diet, if I'm not running mm. is I exist on less than, some days less than 10 grams of carbs a day, usually mm -hmm. around about 20, 25, if you, which is just included in some dairy that I have, cheese, mm -hmm. maybe some natural yogurt occasionally. But like the morning of the run, I'd had a meal, I'd eaten two and a half T-bones for dinner on the Friday. <laughs> I had another T-bone for breakfast on the Saturday morning. The race started at 7.30 and I was taking about a teaspoon of sodium every hour. Okay. Um, with a little bit of potassium, magnesium, so my electrolytes, uh, which, which uh, made a massive difference to how I felt. And as soon as they got low and I could 
I could do that by block your ears if you get a bit grossed out. I was tasting my urine as I was running. <laughs> and uh, and that I could doesn't work. gross me out, but it makes me giggle like crazy. Yeah. I mean, that's it's, so extreme. Everything about this is so extreme. Well, then I, when I passed the finish line, Ruben, I um, celebrated by taking the bite out of a raw uh, organic lamb heart. <laughs> So, that's yet again quite extreme but um but then again i mean maybe it's not maybe maybe it's not extreme at all maybe that's how we were you know meant to be i don't well, know it was a bit of fun for another <laughs> for organuary which is this uh, initiative to encourage more nose to tail uh getting rid of waste waste products from offal so oh, that's yeah right good yeah, that's yeah. a great so, idea there was a reason behind it <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. But anyway, I, I digress. But I was just, I was more curious to get your thoughts because I love talking to you about the stuff. Um, what was going on? And like, clearly, I was roasting calories. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, look, you know, so here's roasting calories is one way to put it. Here's another way to, uh, here's the way that I find people engage with uh, most sort of tangibly when we talk about what's really going on when you're exercising versus sitting still versus, you know, really intense exercise versus low exercise versus uh, resistance training versus cardio, all those things. Uh, there's a lot of adjectives there. Uh, my my uh, fascination with all of this or the, and my approach to it all is to think about it in terms of how much carbon dioxide are you producing per minute? Um, and, it, that's directly related to how much oxygen you're consuming. And both of those things are directly related to how much energy you're burning. So when you burn anything, like just come back out of the human body for a second and look at a piece of paper when you burn it or a piece of wood or some methane gas, whatever it is, when you're burning it, you're uh, combining it with oxygen and you, you're not destroying or creating mass and you are releasing a lot of heat, like energy. In a fire, all of the energy just goes straight to heat. And if you've ever stood next to a methane, balloon full of methane when it gets ignited, you, like you can feel the heat is intense. And we've all sat next to a fire, so you, you know what that feels like. That heat that you feel doesn't weigh anything, essentially. But there's no mass there. That's why we measure that stuff in kilojoules or kilocalories. There's no mass there. Um, to speak of, we can get into physics later and talk about E equals MC squared. There is actually some mass equivalence there, but in chemistry, we don't have to worry about that E equals MC squared stuff at all. So um, what's really interesting is when you when you exercise more, you, you, are, you need more energy, but that means you need to burn more fuel and you need to suck in more oxygen to make that, to be able to burn it. Um, even though we'll get back to that too, because the oxygen that you're breathing in Let's talk about that in a little while. What really happens to the oxygen atoms that you're breathing in? We'll come, we'll circle back around to that. But the thing is, as you're burning the fuel that you've eaten and then combining it with oxygen, you're now producing some waste products that your body has to get rid of. So the reason your breathing rate goes up when you, the, the harder you exercise, the, the higher you get your metabolic rate. The reason you have to breathe more is one, you need more oxygen. But two, you're producing more carbon dioxide and you've got to get that out of your bloodstream because carbon dioxide in your bloodstream reduces the pH of your blood. So your blood literally becomes more acidic as you produce more CO2 and while you hold your breath. So as soon as you hold your breath, if you just sit still, you don't have to exercise to do this. If you just sit still and hold your breath, carbon dioxide starts building up in your blood because you're not breathing it out, but you're still producing it because you, you, you're, resting, you're at your resting metabolic rate, but that produces about a balloon worth of carbon dioxide per hour. Is that why it hurts when you hold your breath for long enough? Yes. Yeah, so uh, the respiratory... Like lactic acid builder? Lactic acid is different again. So uh, the lactic acid buildup is because is, happens when you're exercising at a rate that's too fast for you to provide enough oxygen to keep, uh, to, yeah, to keep up. Yeah. So lactic acid is a, a form of acid that's different to carbonic acid. So uh, the reaction that we're talking about, the thing that happens in your blood, in, and it happens in a glass of water if you bubble carbon dioxide through it, um, 
when carbon dioxide molecules bump into water molecules, CO2 bumps into H2O, they can spontaneously clump together and form a, so we've got three atoms in CO2, we've got three atoms in H2O, CO2, H2O. So six atoms in total, when they collide, these two molecules of three atoms each, they can clump together and form a new molecule, rearranging the atoms a little bit. And the new molecule that you get is called carbonic acid. And that carbonic acid is an acid because like all acids, or all acids of this kind, the ones that we're most familiar with, like all acids, one of the hydrogen atoms that came from the H2O can pop off. And that's what makes it an acid, by the way, what a molecule that can lose one of its hydrogen atoms, actually it's losing a proton, which is the middle of it, and donate it to another atom. That, that's the whole business of making this carbonic acid an acid. And if it builds up in your blood, that means the pH of your blood is going down and you have, they're called chemoreceptors in your brain that can tell the pH of your blood, which is amazing. You've got a pH sensor in your brain. You've got some chemoreceptors in your carotid arteries as well. But it's the ones in your brain that measure CO2. And I'm still not 100% clear on the biochemistry of how this happens in your brain. It's complex. But we know that it's your brain that then notices that, hey, your, your blood CO2 concentration is going up. Or actually, you're in what's called respiratory acidosis, which is the opposite, what's uh, related to, similar to metabolic acidosis, which is what diabetic people can go Keto acidosis, you're talking about? Well, keto acidosis can happen, yeah, uh, in diabetes. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and the impact of that on a person, their blood pH is going down, not because they've built up CO2, but because they're building up ketone bodies in their blood. So there are two different reasons. Metabolic ketoacidosis um, can be onset by uh, in diabetes. Those people, I've never, I've never, I'm not a doctor, right? So I hope I'm not saying anything out of school here. But from what I've read and from knowing my brother's a nurse, my brother-in-law's a nurse, when people in diabetic uh, ketoacidosis present in the emergency ward, they're often their breathing rate is elevated, and that's to do with the fact that your breathing rate elevates when your brain receptors can see that the pH of your blood is changing. And there's two things that can do it. One is hold your breath. The other is go into ketoacidosis. Um, so just sticking with the breathing for a second. So, cause ketoacidosis, as you know, it's a dangerous condition and um, uh, I'm not a medical expert, but when you're holding your breath and you're building up CO2 in your bloodstream, your brain notices it, tells your respiratory drive to increase and you breathe more. So that's like a natural reflex to having more carbon dioxide in your blood. And your blood has to be between seven point, I think it's two and 7.4 uh, pH, which is a tiny narrow little range. And um, you control it by your breathing rate. So it just, it's so clear then that if you start exercising, you're making more CO2. So, hey, guess what you got to do? You got to breathe more. And, and the really exciting thing for people who want to lose weight about that, understanding that fact really at, in a visceral way, if you really get that, then the really exciting fact is that whenever you breathe out CO2, so if you just remember, oxygen goes into your bloodstream via your lungs, O2, that's two atoms of oxygen. But when you breathe out, CO2 comes out. So that's still two oxygen atoms, but now you've stuck a carbon atom in between them. And that means a CO2 molecule is about 7% heavier than a uh, oxygen molecule. Is it 7%? One weighs 20 atomic mass units, one's 27. So it's heavier. When you breathe out, it, it's heavier than what the air you breathe in. So that's where the weight you're wanting to lose is going. Like you, you, if you up your breathing rate, you're losing weight faster than if you just sit still. That's why exercise helps you lose weight. Now, why does exercise make you healthier is a completely different question. 
uh, related, but if all you care about is trying to lose weight, then the reason exercise is so good is it makes you breathe more air out, which contains more CO2, which helps you lose weight faster than if you just sit still. Simple. It's so interesting, Ruben, and being able to hear you explain it. And, and I feel like I'm able to keep on track of, of most of what you're saying here. Um, and I know this is one of the, the major reasons that you are a proponent of free education in the fields of uh, science, maths, and literacy, I think. Um, I love that. Yes. And, and, and because the more people that are able to understand these concepts, the, the more the knowledge can be shared. And, and I mean, it, it, makes, it makes perfect sense to me. I mean, I've spent the last five years for health reasons and pure fascination reasons trying to understand the dietary side of things. And, and I've lost the weight. I've kept it off. Um, even during COVID, when I put it back on through eating, um, you know, emotional eating sugar, mm -hmm. I've been able, as soon as I cut that out, I'm down nearly 10 kilos in six weeks um, and five and a half, six percent body fat as well, according to the, the scales. Yeah. Um, I'm going to get an MRI. I've been given a prescription for a full body MRI to see what exactly what my, uh, my, my body fat percentage is. Um, I'm pretty lean at the moment and, uh, the, the leaner I get, the better I feel and yada, yada, yada. Yeah. So there's a guy I was listening to recently. His name's Dr. Sean O'Meara. He's, he's in America. And he's he talks a lot about the importance of getting rid of things like visceral fat and the benefits of getting rid of visceral fat and, and keeping a very low level of subcutaneous fat and all the other benefits of that kind of thing as well. Do you, do you have any interest in exploring that side of things with what you've learned? Absolutely fascinated uh, to listen to the experts on that because I'm not an expert on that, um, but I, I know exactly what you're talking about. And um, so all I can do is parrot what they're saying and, um, and keep my ears open for what they find next. But yeah, so visceral fat has a different metabolic profile. And I guess hopefully most people know the difference what between visceral fat and subcutaneous fat is these days. You're but explain not, <laughs> maybe, maybe they don't. Yeah. So visceral fat is the fat around your organs. It's on the inside of your, the muscles that so you like on the inside of your six pack essentially. Um, and so if that uh, fat depot enlarges, you get that beach ball shaped beer belly. Whereas subcutaneous fat is the fat that's all over your body, under your skin, between your epidermis and your muscle layer below it. And when that's, fat depot enlarges it tends to hide the striations in your muscle um, because you've now got like a thick doona of fat over them and it hides your um your veins and and so forth so you, you yeah you look pudgy which i did too i mean i i was uh, 86 kilos and i didn't feel looking in the mirror i didn't particularly feel like i was very overweight and I was only five kilos over what the World Health Organization sort of recommends for that, um, for my height. So, you know, when I talk to people about weight loss, if, if sometimes they go, yeah, but you weren't really overweight. Well, actually, I actually really was a little bit overweight. And the weird thing I think at the moment is we're also used to people being a little bit overweight that when you see someone who's five kilos overweight, they just look normal. Um, and then when you lose weight, you might have experienced this yourself, I imagine, because you're looking very lean, um, which Thanks. I think is a good look. Like, I, I think you look just healthy, really. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I am healthy. Right. Yeah. Makes yeah. Sense. yeah. Yeah, it does make sense. Um, but yeah, when, it's almost like uh, when, when you chat to some people, it's like you weren't overweight enough to be allowed to have an opinion about you know what's a healthy weight etc so it's such a controversial um topic always has been i suppose but it's it's almost more controversial than it has ever been but back to your question about the visceral fat versus uh subcutaneous fat and and what's the best kind to have yeah i'm fascinated by that but i don't have any expertise other than what i've read that you know they have a different metabolic profile they pump out different um hormones and chemicals that can either be pro-inflammatory 
uh, and the subcutaneous fat seems to pump out hormones that are actually beneficial for you. So it might be protective to have a little bit more of that subcutaneous fat. Problem is, you don't really, as far as I know, have much control over if you want to put on a little bit of visceral, uh, sorry, a little bit of subcutaneous fat, but reduce your visceral fat. Like, how do you go about doing that? What's what's the exercise? And uh, so, so you'll say it's it's your diet and eating. Well, um, well, tell me, tell me what. So, what so, you've so what I've learned, and what I'll do, what I'll do, Ruben, is I'll I'll introduce you um, to some some content offline with this guy, Dr. Sean O'Meara. So, the studies that they've been conducting, he had a, he had a clinic, and I I think they had MRIs and and the research facilities, um, and not just their data, but a bunch of other data. What they're finding is, and you touched on it a little bit before, the to develop vascularity, you've got to get rid of the visceral fat. And what they are ascertaining with visceral fat is that it's there's a there's a huge amount of um, cytokine storm uh, storms that come with that, um, which are not very good from what I can tell. the The way to get rid of visceral fat is to get rid of refined carbohydrate, and one of the one of the things that I did actually, uh, so I quit alcohol in September on September twenty sixth, two thousand and sixteen. Haven't had a drop since, and I got a DEXA scan done the day that I quit, and three months later, and I lost three and a half kilos of visceral fat around my organs, and I also went in for snoring surgery in 2009, where they lasered out my uvula and drilled out my nose, which I'm, I don't regret anything now, Ruben, but I'm upset at times that I got that done because had I known the information I have now, I right. could have quit the alcohol and the smoking and lo lost the visceral fat right. and my snoring would have resolved itself. It seems yeah. to be the thing, right? Right. Going back to the, to lose the visceral fat and to keep the subcutaneous fat, the healthy, you know, at a, at a reasonable thin amount, you've just got to go adopt a, lo a low carb diet, whatever that works for you. And without doing any exercise, it'll naturally regulate itself and you'll return to that homeostatic state is what he talks about. And he was talking about the, the vascularity. So down here that, you, that I've certainly noticed in my own exercises, but he was talking about when you start getting really healthy, these veins here, they start to pulse and you can you can physically see them apparently. Um, I haven't paid enough attention to it, but this podcast uh, I'll recommend and I'll link it below for people that want to watch it as well. So yes. there's some well, fascinating stuff coming out. But anyway, just your thoughts on that. Uh, well, I, I will sit down and read the, uh, the published uh, peer-reviewed literature on that. If you, Anything that you can send me, I will read it um, uh, with like a, yeah, I, I consume that stuff. Yeah, um, but there's just so many different things to keep up with. But that in particular, if there's good evidence that those, that eating low carb um, shifts your fat profile from being like without doing anything else, she said. So like, you know, I'd want to see, again, I'm a bit of a nerd and, um, and I think we all should be like, if, if you say just holding, like if all you did was stopped, switch to a low carb diet, um, that that then shifts your fat from being more visceral to more subcutaneous. If that's actually true, which I'm not saying it's not, I haven't read the research that you're talking about, but um, if that's true, that's amazing and really good. Like that would be a really potentially, I, I, I guess, because I mean, there's so much more. This is why I keep saying it. Health is so complicated compared to just losing weight. Uh, and there's healthy ways to lose weight and unhealthy ways to lose weight. All I can tell you is that when you're losing weight, you, you're doing it because you're breathing out more carbon atoms than you're putting back in. This stuff is really interesting, though. Like, I mean, th this business of uh, does a low carbohydrate diet. Uh, well, there's there's no denying that 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 adopting low carb is really effective for, for for weight loss, right? There's no there's science is undeniable with that. What Sean was talking about also was that people that are losing more visceral fat were gaining IQ points. They were they were becoming smarter, and it had something to do. He was talking about the carotid artery or something along. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was something to do with the pathways clearing up. Certainly adopting a, a ketogenic diet, you're burning 
ketones, which are the most efficient fuel source um, for the human body. My, my brain thinking and stuff has improved through the roof in the last few years being, and as soon as if I ever have a, a period where I overeat carbohydrate, which doesn't happen a lot now, I definitely feel a bit more sluggish. Right. Uh, so he, they've submitted papers and there'd be some fascinating stuff, but like um, there was no downside to it. Do you know what right. I mean? Like okay. from the people that he was working with. So yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. No, look, I, um, I, I come up against the question of low carb versus low fat diets a lot and, uh, and, and which one's better for weight loss. Um, and you see, so living the experience of being on any particular diet, I haven't done the low carb diet, so I can't tell what the lived experience of being on a low carb diet is like, but I hear lots of people and uh, say that they feel amazing. They have more energy than, um, normal, uh, like it's elevated. They sometimes feel euphoric. My sister's been on this diet. She's had that exact reaction. Um, and, and plenty of people I know have had that reaction. A few people I know, interestingly, didn't have it. And one of the people is um, half of a couple that I know, and they both went on it together. And um, the woman loves it still. Uh, well, last time I spoke, still on the ketogenic diet, but the guy who was just as uh, open to it just didn't work for him. And, you know, that's still N equals one. So uh, there, there um, can be, the can, just to just comment on that as well, there can be a lot of, uh, issues in the early stages with uh, oxalate dumping. Um, so I don't know if you know much about this side of, so a lot of plants, things like spinach, for example, is one of the highest oxalate. So it's a natural uh, protection mechanism that the plant has built in so that bugs and stuff don't eat it because it can't run away. If you've got a large accumulation of things like oxalate in your body, and a lot of them are stored in your joints and in fat. If you're rapidly dumping weight, there's a there's a can be a really um, f intense response. Which if like a friend of mine who used to suffer from really bad eczema, he went on a strict carnivore diet initially and had the most extraordinary flare up, and and it scared him a little bit because he was sort of new to it. This is a year and a half ago. He's now adopted a ketogenic. Uh, lifestyle he's lost 18 kilos and his skin has improved through the roof because maybe that it was a much slower release and they they talk about this a lot it's really fascinating so well like i said i'm not an expert on any of that um i'm not a medical person and i don't even know how many medical people would claim to know you know the intricacies of what's going on there because that's oh, yeah. it's well and that, there's a very good reason for that, probably. I mean, this biochemistry is insanely complicated. And so, you know, you can, we can focus on specific uh, metabolites and watch them go up and down in a large group of people uh, and try to draw conclusions from it. But the literature is just chock-a-block full of the you know, molecule of the month, you could say. And um, the people who really do know this stuff are still finding new molecules or new interactions or new um, enzymes or new epigenetic uh, effects of this diet versus that diet that I just think, I, I, I don't know what to think. I'm just a non-expert watching what the experts are finding out like yourself, you know? So I, I can't like me giving you my opinion on that is like just two people talking about it in the pub, which is great. Like it's good to have those chats, but I don't want to pass myself off as someone who knows more than they do. I'll tell you what I know um, and what I feel very comfortable uh, talking about and what my mission in life is. Uh, I know that most people, when you mention the word oxoacetate, uh, oxalate? Oxalate, yeah, oxalate. Oxalate is the one. Yeah, because it's so, so most people don't know when I say carbohydrate what that means. Like, what does the word carbohydrate really? actually mean? Oh, mate. Um, go, to my, <laughs> go to my YouTube channel and check out the video where I went down to Bondi Beach. I, I watched it. I watched right. it. Right. Yeah. August 2019. Right. right. So you go, I went down there and said to people, 
what's the gas you're inhaling? And they all knew it was oxygen. Great. What's the gas you're exhaling? They all knew it was CO2. Then when I asked them, great, where does the carbon in the exhaled carbon dioxide come from? And zero of them knew the answer, including not one, but two PE teachers. Uh, one of whom I asked in the video on the day, I said, oh, that's, um, you know, he, he sort of, he's a really great guy. And, and all those people that I spoke to were terrific. And all of them were clever and smart and not stupid and well-educated. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with them. There's something wrong with the way we're teaching this. Uh, and so, I mean, the, the PE teacher, such a great guy. Um, he thought about the question, when you lose weight, where does it go? He sort of stood there thinking for a second. He goes, oh, good question. Um, uh, is, it, is it the environment? Is it plants? Is it the food you eat? And he sort of walked himself to the answer. And I said, there you go. You've, you've got there. You nailed it. And he was like, oh, really? Um, I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I, for all of the people, I said, so, you know, as a clue for where the carbon's coming from. And by the way, some people were guessing, is it come from pollution? Does it come from um, cars? Like, holy dooly, they think that the carbon atoms in their breath got there because of all the pollution in the air. So, you know, fair guess. Yeah. If no one's ever taught you, like, why would you know? So it's not that they're dumb for having a guess, they're good on them. But what a gigantic gap in health literacy when we're, we, you know, here we are having conversations about whether a low fat diet versus a low carb diet is better for you. And we're getting into some massively complicated biochemistry, but the average punter has no idea what the word carbohydrate means or where the carbon atoms they breathe out comes from. And so for anyone listening to this, who's sort of doubts that this gap in health literacy exists, just just ask your friends and family where the carbon they exhale comes from and just be amazed. And then when you say the word carbohydrates as a clue, if you look carefully, you will see an actual light bulb appear above people's heads and glow because it's like, oh, carbohydrates. What does, what does that word mean? Um, and what it means, the, the word was coined in the 1800s by chemists who noticed that the carbohydrates that they were studying, so glucose, fructose, what they noticed was that um, those carbohydrates had one part carbon, they were made of one part of the element carbon. And then for each part of carbon, there was two parts of hydrogen and one part of oxygen. So two H's and an O, H2O. So it's carbon that's been hydrated by because H2O is water. Yeah. So that's literally the etymology of the word. But if we are trying to explain this complex biochemistry to people and they don't even know, you know, if they glaze over when you start talking about atoms and molecules, then we have no way of really communicating this stuff. So that's my mission is to just give people the basics knowledge so that we can go up from there. Well, I think it's really great, Ruben. I think I my mission, amongst other things, is to be the, the number one motivational speaker on the planet, right? That's my thing. But the other thing as well, like because I'm not a scientist, I have a lot of knowledge that I've acquired. So the best way for me to get my point across is to look like a million bucks. So because, <laughs> because you know, a picture paints a thousand words. And I think sure. this is the great thing about being in shape, you know, like it just it has so much more impact. And it's funny, you know, Dr. Sean talks about how healthy looking people, uh, he's dealing with a lot of like executive CEOs, you know, that, that are getting in really good shape so they can influence more. And there's a direct evolutionary link. Women are evolutionary, evolutionary like engineered to be more attracted to scars on men because of the, the alpha male like it's so right, right we could talk about this and we might have to have you back on the show in the future i think we've blown a few minds i think we should wrap this up but before we do is there anything you'd like to finish on well uh yeah okay if for, for listeners to go away uh, 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 who are interested in this weight loss business and how to become more literate in speaking about it um I would love the project that I'm working on at the moment is to try and get uh, 
atoms and molecules into the primary school curriculum so that we can teach children that the food they eat turns into carbon dioxide. We can't do that with the current curriculum. So most people have not thought about the science curriculum. And here's what I'd love your listeners to do is to go away and think about this question. At all of modern science currently, you need to understand a little bit about atoms and molecules, the periodic table, and that's just to understand the basics of like, you know, a modern transistor in your smartphone is made of about a thousand atoms. That blows my mind. But if you don't really know much about atoms, it's like, oh, okay. Well, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, the, the, the atoms you're breathing out as carbon dioxide, can't, all of them come from your food. That's mind blowing. All of this is mind blowing. But if you don't know really what atoms and molecules are, if you don't really viscerally understand them, you can't enjoy the, how amazing this information is. You just don't get the benefit of knowing it. And at the moment, every Western curriculum in the whole world uh, and the developing countries are following the same model none of the curriculums australia's americas england's all of europe they don't introduce children to the concept that everything's made out of atoms and molecules until they're in grade nine that's when they hear the word atom and molecule so wow. uh, if your kids don't watch youtube if they don't watch tv and all of their information comes from their teachers and all of their teachers follow the curriculum to the t your kids will never learn about atoms and molecules until they're in grade nine. And then they're expected to learn like so much information before they finish grade 10, that it's impossible. And the analogy is, uh, and the reason I can't get people excited about understanding, you know, what's going on with atoms and molecules in their bodies, because it's just, they've never learned it properly. The analogy that I like to give people about this is, uh, Look at how we teach people to read and write, which is you know very important. Look at how we teach maths, equally important. So let's just quickly look at those two things. To, to teach kids how to read and write, the very first thing they need to learn is very obviously the alphabet. And we start that before they get to school. That kids are singing the alphabet. We give them toys with the alphabet on them. We stick letters on the fridge. They see it on Play School, Sesame Street. They've, by the time they get to school, they can sing the alphabet song. Um, and I work with preschoolers a lot. And so all I have to do is sit at the piano and play the first two chords and they'll start singing it because we just, it's so important to learn the alphabet. And then by, if you know the alphabet, then you can put letters of the alphabet together to make words. And as soon as you can make words, then you can start making sentences. And with sentences, you can then start to write stories, poems, music, and you can keep going, learning grammar and get all the way to Shakespeare. And it's such a clear and obvious sequence to teaching children how to read and write. Um, and, we, and we started early, very early, before school. Same with mathematics, like to teach children to be uh, numerate, to know some maths you start with the very first thing which we do before they even get to school is we teach them how to count and children love doing this by the way they love counting when they're toddlers and uh, and and once you can count then we can teach you how to add numbers together then you can subtract multiply and all the way through to learning calculus well if you look at the science curriculum you will not find a sequence that makes any sense. It jumps from solids and liquids and gases in grade uh, three. It, it goes back to them in grade five. At no point mentioning that actually when ice cubes melt, it's the molecules of water breaking apart and just becoming loose from each other. No mention of that till grade nine. So you can see why I've had so much trouble since 2013 when I sort of figured out this weight loss stuff trying to get people that everyone's fascinated that you breathe out your fat, but then they can't take that information and do anything useful with it because they can't see the bigger picture that, oh, you turn fat in your body into carbon dioxide, but you turn food into carbon dioxide too. So if you're putting more carb food in than you're breathing out, that's the whole issue. And I, so that my mission is to change the curriculum, which is probably harder than becoming the most, the best uh, motivational speaker in the world because we're up against sort of a couple of hundred years of um, 
uh, curriculum development and yeah and so well, you know we're trying to steer the Titanic and turn it around and, and I'm up against and it's not just me this is not my idea to get atoms and molecules into the primary school curriculum there's people much smarter than me have been trying to do it for a lot longer but I've noticed that there's a direct connection to your health literacy because if you don't know where the carbon in your breath comes from what else don't you know about biochemistry and it's all biochemistry. So yeah, that, that's my mission. So where do we find you, Ruben? Uh, well, I am currently uh, all over the place. I visit schools. Uh, if people want to uh, book me in to come and do a school visit for their kids at their schools, if you're a teacher or a principal listening, you can just go to my website, rubenmearman.com and um, get in touch. And I do school visits all over the place. I do a hundred of them a year when there's no pandemic around. Um, and I can teach your uh, primary school aged kids the periodic table and I can teach your teachers how to teach it. Um, so that's one thing I do. Um, the other thing, I mean, you know, the TEDx talks are still online and, and hopefully very soon. I have a YouTube channel and I'm just about to start populating that with these basic lessons about the periodic table, some basic lessons about chemistry what's going on in a fire, what's going on in a person when you're burning food and fat and so forth. So Ruben Nearman is my um, YouTube channel as well, so keep an eye out. Well, this has been very fascinating and hopefully a great learning experience for everyone listening. I've certainly learned a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, Ruben Nearman. Thank you.